Thank you very much. It's uh, always a pleasure to be here with the humanists, even on a warm Sunday morning. Um, so yes, the, uh, the topic for this morning is our new national security strategy as outlined by President Barack Obama in a major speech at the National War College on May 23rd, just about a month ago. A lot of people saw this as a game changer. A major speech announcing a new direction in our now 12-year-old war on terror, or global war on terror, as the uh, Bushites used to like to refer to it. A lot of commentators, um, even on the left, were very enthusiastic about it. Robert Dreyfus from Nation Magazine, for example, in his uh, first take on it, declared, the war on terror is over. And uh, commentator after commentator had pretty much the same, same reaction. I have to admit that when I first listened to it uh, live and watched, it on, watched the speech on TV, I was pretty impressed. I'm still impressed by some of the things that he said. But overall, my idea this morning is to dig into the speech, because I got the transcript, read it several times, uh, to see what he was really saying about what the future shape of this war on terror might be. Now, of course, the war on terror, we've, as I just mentioned, have been living with it for 12 years now. And this global war on terror has cost the United States nearly 7,000 lives, tens of thousands uh, who have been injured on the battlefield and uh, probably will be dealing with those injuries, physical, mental, and otherwise, for the rest of their lives. Um, has cost the lives of who knows how many Iraqis and Afghans, a million or more, nobody counts anymore. And it's cost over a trillion dollars of taxpayer money. The war on terror has led to a massive erosion of civil liberties here in this country. And although that's currently in the news, he did not address that in the speech, so I'm not going to be getting into these recent revelations by Edward Snowden about the, what the NSA is doing, uh, or has been doing for 12 years. It's not much different. Or for the last 40 years. We live in a surveillance state. But the civil liberties situation during this war on terror has deteriorated immensely. But again, he didn't address that in this speech. Um, those revelations came afterwards, so I guess the next major speech will be the end of the global war on our personal communications or something. And finally, to me, the biggest damage of the global war on terror is that it led this country to endorse and engage in what's uh, usually called preemptive war. But let us make no mistake, preemptive war is aggressive war. The attack on Iraq was a war of aggression, tied to the global war on terror, supposedly. A war of aggression, according to the Nuremberg principles and the judges at the Nuremberg tribunals following World War II, aggressive war is the highest war crime that any state can engage in. As they said at Nuremberg, it is from, the war, from a war of aggression that all other war crimes derive. And this country, through its Congress and its president and its administration, back in 2001 with the authorization for the use of military force and then the invasion of Iraq, engaged in aggressive war. So it would be good news indeed if after all these 12 years that we were going to change course from this damage, uh, all kinds of damage that we've seen in the past 12 years. So was the speech a game changer? What's in the speech? What did he say? What was the new vision? Let me quote some from the speech. And like I said, there's some good stuff in here. Quoting Obama, America is at a crossroads. We must define the nature and scope of this struggle, or else it will define us. Mindful of James Madison's warning that, quote, no nation could preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare, end quote. Well, I think we're seeing that come true. Quoting the president again, we must define our effort not as a boundless global war on terror, but rather as a series of persistent, targeted efforts to dismantle specific networks of violent extremists that threaten America. 
Okay, that sounds all right. We want an end to the war. We know it's damaging to our society, to our civil liberties, to our treasury, and to the lives of our young people. And I do want to say, I felt this was a very important speech. It's important for a president to stand up and say things like this, to try to redirect how we think about this global war that, that we've been engaged in now for 12 years. Extremely important. No one's doing it. No one has been doing it. And I think this is a president that is uncomfortable with intervention, especially in the Middle East, where it has backfired time and time and time again. And he was acknowledging that the endless war on terror is unsustainable. So I want to thank him for that because it does open a conversation. It's going to lead to this morning's talk, right? We're all going to be thinking about uh, these issues. But the problem comes when you go through the details of what he's laying out for the new strategy. And this is where it becomes a bit of a disappointment. So basically, through the speech, he talked about what he refers to as targeted actions or targeted efforts. This is the drone war that we've all heard so much about, and it's what I'm going to really concentrate on a lot this morning, because that has become the face of our global war on terror. This country's remote controlled killing, murder, assassination at a distance. So he talked about that quite a bit and was making an effort to try to justify the drone warfare, to demonstrate that it is carefully controlled, that oversight is keen on it, and that they are careful to avoid as best they can civilian casualties and only go after the highest ranking uh, members of Al-Qaeda. He also talked in the speech about uh, the need for diplomacy and effective partnerships and how we've damaged our relationship with Pakistan, for example, and that he wants to re-improve that, so diplomatic uh, efforts. And he talked about uh, foreign aid and foreign policy and how rather than bombing people, we really should be building schools and uh, you know, buying some goodwill around the country, all of which I can agree with. So here's his um, statement kind of summarizing what he's saying, quoting the president. Targeted action against terrorists, effective partnerships, diplomatic engagement and assistance. Through such a comprehensive strategy, we can significantly reduce the chances of large-scale attacks on the homeland and mitigate threats to Americans overseas. The takeaway from this is that this is really what we've been doing for the past 12 years. Outside of the massive invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, certainly since um, the Iraq invasion fell apart and drone warfare was being used, uh, became the weapon of choice, this is what we've been doing. Sending drones around the world to kill identified terrorists, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more, Certainly, diplomacy has remained as part of what America does, looking for effective partnerships in fighting terrorism and foreign assistance. We've been doing all these things. So where is the game changer? This is what we've been doing. And of most concern is the continuation. No matter how well he tries to justify it and tell us how careful and safe and effective it is, the drone war continues, and as I said, that is the face of our war on terror right now. He says, quoting again, it is in this context that the United States has taken lethal targeted action against Al-Qaeda and its associated forces, including with remotely piloted aircraft commonly referred to as drones. As was true in previous armed conflicts, this new technology raises profound questions about who is targeted and why, about civilian casualties and the risks of creating new enemies, about the legality of such strikes under U.S. and international law, about accountability and morality." End quote. Well, that's what I want to talk about, the legality and morality and who is dying and who is being targeted in these drone strikes. And finally, 
Let me start on this part, uh, another quote from his speech. Despite our strong preference for the detention and prosecution of terrorists, sometimes this approach is foreclosed. Our strong preference for detention and prosecution, in other words, actually physically grabbing an identified terrorist who's plotting attacks, bringing them into U.S. custody and putting them through our uh, judicial system. I'm afraid with this setup, I'm going to spill water on it and zap myself. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about this um, strong preference for detention and prosecution. So let's roll the calendar back to um, early 2004. This is the history of the first drone strike outside of Afghanistan. This is when the drone war on terror began, was 2004. Drones were being used in Afghanistan in the course of that war, um, but then it got expanded. The United States war in Afghanistan had been raging for about two and a half years. The Iraq invasion had already fallen apart after less than a year, and a full-blown insurgency was bombing its way across that already devastated country. The CIA, which had already been operating unmanned aerial vehicles, drones if you prefer, I do, in Afghanistan as part of the war effort there, was keen to use the technology inside of Pakistan, of course right on the border with Afghanistan, especially in those regions that directly bordered Afghanistan. The only problem was that Pakistan wouldn't allow it. That country's leadership had no desire to see the armed conflict that was devastating its neighbors its neighbor brought across the border to Pakistani territory. Now there's a particular reason why the CIA wanted to expand its use of drones in order to target, assassinate Al-Qaeda and other militants. A blistering report by the CIA's Inspector General, John Helgerson, had just been released. This is early 2004. Helgerson's report revealed for the first time the extensive abuses that had arisen from the CIA's global program of capture, detention, and interrogation of suspected terrorists and their sympathizers. This is the CIA's inspector general blowing the cover on our strong preference for detention and capture. The report shone a light on the so-called black sites where the CIA routinely engaged in torture and abuse of its detainees. The reaction at home was startling, and the CIA was looking for a way out of the detention and interrogation business. It's too messy. What do you do with them once you capture them? They decided that simply killing suspects secretly would be far easier and much less messy politically. That's our preferred commitment to um, detention and capture. Looking for leverage with the Pakistani government, and in particular with Pakistan's own version of the CIA, the Directorate for Inter Intelligence Services, or ISI as it's known in that country, the CIA turned its attention to a Pakistan, Pakistani Taliban leader named Nek Mohammed. Mr. Mohammed was a burden to Pakistan's government and to the ISI in particular. He was extremely popular among the population, uh, especially in the border territories in Pakistan, a restive and dangerous area of the country. And he was, most troubling of all for Pakistan, leading, a success, leading successful military attacks against the Pakistan National Army. His goal was to create an Islamic state in Pakistan. Had nothing to do with Afghanistan. So, Nek Mohammed was clearly an enemy of the Pakistani state, but he had no designs on attacking the United States or its forces in Afghanistan, and the U.S. intelligence services did not consider him to be their problem. As it turned out, though, Nek Mohammed did turn out to be the CIA's bargaining chip. The CIA station chief in Pakistan approached the head of ISI with a proposal. The CIA would take out Nek Mohammed with a drone strike in Pakistan in return for Pakistani permission for the CIA to use Pakistan's airspace for more such missions 
going on into the future. A deal was struck. Pakistan would allow the drones to fly and kill in the tribal areas in the western part of the nation. In return, the CIA would keep the program absolutely secret, never to utter a word about it. Pakistan, for its part, would deny any knowledge of the program or, at times, take credit for an assassination themselves. On June 18th, 2004, almost nine years ago to the day, as Nek Mohammed sat in a mud hut in South Waziristan, a missile fired from a CIA drone killed him, along with several others who were present there in that hut, including two teenage boys. That was the start of the drone war on terror. June 18, 2004, we killed a Pakistani terrorist who had designs on the Pakistani state, had nothing at all to do with the United States or our security. As of that moment, the United States was engaged in a secretive global war of assassination. So, let's take a moment to think about drones and what they are, because we hear the term a lot in our news, um, but I don't think people really have a full understanding of, of what we're talking about. The term drone is really a misnomer to begin with. Strictly speaking, a drone is an unmanned aircraft that can fly autonomously, that is, without a human in control. What we are talking about in this case are unmanned aerial vehicles or UAVs that are remotely piloted. And for the purposes of this talk, the, uh, the correct term is unmanned combat aerial vehicles. Or, if you want to listen to retired Air Force Colonel Sally McBride, who testified at Senate hearings on the drone program in April, the proper, proper term is remotely piloted aircraft. According to Colonel McBride, who was engaged in drone targeting programs when she worked for AFRICOM, use of the term drones plays right into Al-Qaeda's propaganda campaign. So we shouldn't call them drones. Not if we don't want the terrorists to win. I'm going to call them drones. It's a lot easier to say. Drone technology has been deployed in around 75 countries so far. Do you know that? 75 countries have drones, almost all of which are the unarmed surveillance variety. Currently, only the United States and England, which assists in drone strikes in Afghanistan and Pakistan, are using armed drones. Israel, which has developed its own armed drones, used them during its assault on Gaza in late 2008-2009. That's the only other known use of uh, combat drones outside of uh, the United States government. But as the United States paves the way for ever-increasing use of drones as an instrument of war, it is easy to see a looming arms race in this field, especially with 75 countries already having the technology. In the case of the United States, there are two main models of drone that are being used for the global assassination program. They're called the Reaper and the Predator. These are really nice names, huh? Predator uh, drone is about 27 feet long, wingspan of 33 feet. This makes it about the size of a Cessna airplane. They're usually armed with two Hellfire missiles, which have warheads with about 20 pounds of explosives in them. The much preferred and more active Reaper drone, by contrast, is uh, nearly twice as long, with a wingspan twice the size. So imagine the a Cessna private aircraft that you see down at Palo Alto Airport double it in size, and this is the unmanned uh, combat drone that, that's being carried around. Uh, with its uh, larger size, it can carry not only Hellfire missiles, but also 500-pound bombs. And that's a lot of firepower. I've actually been in the vicinity of 500-pound bombs being dropped when I was in El Salvador during the 1980s, during the course of their uh, civil war, and uh, would go down to be with uh, displaced people down there, and the bombing was going on right over the hill. Uh, it's a par and I've seen what it does on the ground. It is a powerful weapon. Uh, a 500 pound bomb has what the uh, engineers call an effective casualty radius of about 200 feet. So if you're at a football stadium, and then you're in the end zone and they drop a 500-pound bomb on the 50-yard line, you're probably going to die. So these aren't the smart, targeted weapons that, that we're uh, being told that they are. 
Drones can stay airborne for up to 24 hours and have a range of hundreds of miles. Predator drone costs $20 million. The Reaper goes for $54 million each. The Pentagon currently has about 7,000 drones of all types, including surveillance drones. And this year's budget includes $5 billion for additional drone research, deployment, and procurement. $5 billion. So I don't see a big rollback uh, in the drone program. And the President's speech on May 23rd certainly didn't imply that at all. Drones are remotely piloted by two-person teams consisting of a pilot. And right now, the pilot usually is an actual trained pilot. Uh, and a senior operator whose job it is to manipulate the cameras and heat sensors and other sensors that are on the drones, how they see what they're looking at from afar. The control centers for drones don't have to be anywhere near the scene of the action. Indeed, many of the flights are controlled from hundreds and thousands of miles away. There are dozens of drone command centers worldwide, with dozens more planned for the near future. Some of the command centers that we know about are in Langley, Virginia, where the CIA is headquartered and where the CIA operates two command centers, and at the Creech and Nellis Air Force Bases near Las Vegas, Nevada. There are also command and control centers in California, Arizona, New Mexico, North and South Dakota, Missouri, Ohio, New York, and no doubt elsewhere in the continental United States. The Air Force alone currently has more than 1,300 drone pilots. 1,300. And they claim to be short-staffed by some 300 pilots. See, this is a program you read about once in a while in the newspaper, and you have no idea the extent of it. And that's why I wanted to take the opportunity of the President's speech to explain drones, to kind of explain the other side of drones, the part that we never get to see. According to a report in the New York Times last summer, quote, the Pentagon projects that the Air Force will need more than 2,000 drone pilots for combat air patrols operating 24 hours a day worldwide, end quote. 2,000 pilots operating 24 hours a day worldwide. That's our drone program. That same New York Times report, by the way, profiles a drone pilot who works out of the Hancock Field Air National Guard base in the suburbs of Syracuse, New York. From his computer console in the suburbs, Colonel St Scott Brenton tracks and kills human beings in Afghanistan. When his workday is done, according to the Times story, Brenton, quote, steps out of a dark room of video screens, his adrenaline still surging after squeezing the trigger, and commutes home past fast food restaurants and convenience stores to help the kids with the homework." End quote. It's become a commuter job, 24 hours a day. As far as we know, the United States is actively using armed drones in Afghanistan, where, as I said, the first combat drones were deployed uh, for that invasion, and where they will continue to be used after the so-called withdrawal of U.S. troops next year. Obama did refer to this in his speech and implied that we'll be using them less once he brings the troops home next year from Afghanistan. But they will continue to be used in Afghanistan uh, in the foreseeable future. We're also using drones in Pakistan, as we know, uh, which is by far seen the highest level of activity, logically so, because it borders Afghanistan, and also in Yemen and Somalia. We don't know where else they might have been used because not all the drone strikes are announced. We are told that they consult with Congress on each drone strike, but we, the people, never hear about it. There have been reports, for example, of possible drone strikes in, Phil in the Philippines, where there's also an Islamic insurgency on some of the islands. But we don't know at this point. The ACLU has tried for years to get information about the drone program, uh, all without success. Uh, using the Freedom of Information Act, the government has been arguing in court that it cannot confirm or deny that a drone program even exists citing the old standby of national security. This is a standard thing to deny Freedom of Information Act requests. 
We can't confirm or deny its national security. We can't respond. Courts uh, defer to the government. But uh, recently, and this was before Obama's speech in May, but I, I believe it was April, uh, a federal court ruled that the government can no longer use that excuse for refusing to release the information to the, to the ACLU since the president himself has referred to the program in public and now has done so again. And I want to mention, I think one of the, this is a good point to, to throw this in, I think one of the reasons that Obama gave the speech when he did is because you and I have been speaking out about drones and about Guantanamo. That's mostly what he talked about. It was public pressure on the, about these programs that got him to speak out a little bit more. We didn't get what we wanted. We need a lot more transparency from this president who promised the most transparent administration ever, whether it's on drones or Guantanamo or on NSA spying. And as we can see by the speech, responses do come to an engaged public that will uh, question the policies vociferously. Right now, keeping track of drone strikes, the frequency and location number of victims has been left to really a few private groups that have dedicated themselves to trying to figure out just how extensive the program is. We don't get this information from our government. We don't get it from our Congress. We get it from nonprofit journalistic endeavors. Uh, the best one is probably the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, a London-based journalism nonprofit organization located at the City University in London. What they do is, uh, all these groups that are trying to do it, is they track newspaper accounts, uh, especially Pakistan newspapers, news reporting in Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, to the extent that they can, they go out and try to interview witnesses. They cross-tabulate all this stuff and try to come up with figures for uh, low estimates, high estimates, who's being killed. So the, uh, some of the numbers are truly startling. And I, I don't want to throw a lot of numbers at you on a Sunday morning. But let me go back to Obama's speech with another quick quote to introduce this. Quote, there is a wide gap between U.S. assessments of such casualties and non-governmental reports. A wide gap, no kidding. Nevertheless, it is a hard fact that U.S. strikes have resulted in civilian casualties, a risk that exists in all wars. It's the first time that this administration has admitted that civilians have died in the drone strike casualties. As recently as last year, John Brennan, who in, uh, currently uh, at the CIA, he was the National Security Advisor. He was the guy who uh, was the major proponent of expanding the drone war. He was saying, up through last year, that no civilians had died, that none had died. I'll return to this, but basically the reason he could say that is because they consider any male over the age of 14 to be a possible militant. So if you kill a group of teenagers, you've killed six militants. You haven't killed six teenagers. That's how they could say that. So it's significant that the president would admit that. So overall, there have been in uh, Yemen, Somalia, and Pakistan, and overwhelmingly the numbers are all in Pakistan, close to uh, 370 drone strikes total. A total of 4,000 people have been killed. That's the high number, high estimate. The low estimate is somewhere around 3,000. So we're talking about a lot of people have died. Of those 4,000 that have been presumed to be killed or identified, 900 civilians have been identified by the researchers. So that's almost one-fourth of the victims are civilians. And again, that's because these are not all that accurate. They have a big blast area. And we're going to hear some more about why they're being killed. And of those 900 civilians that were killed, 200 of them were children. Clearly not militants. There's also been an estimated 1,700 uh, injuries, again, mostly lifelong disabling injuries. 
In total, the numbers add up to a record, a tremendous amount of death and destruction, tremendous number of people maimed, many of them no doubt maimed for life. And keep in mind that this is mostly a secret record, ferreted out only by the dedication of some hardworking uh, forensic journalists. We certainly haven't gotten these numbers from the Pentagon, the CIA, or the White House, who uh, even given the, the President's uh, revealing speech, aren't talking numbers. So, let's take one of the President's questions. Is this really legal? Have all these strikes and all this death come about in a legal manner in keeping with the oft-repeated mantra of the United States that we are a country ruled by law and not by individuals? Let's, might, let's start with what might be the first logical and perhaps simplest question to ask. How could this policy of targeted killing possibly be in keeping uh, with a presidential ban on assassinations that dates back to Jimmy Carter? Um, and it actually dates back to Gerald Ford, I'm sorry. He issued the first presidential ban on assassinations when the Church Committee back in the 1970s learned that the CIA was going around the world assassinating people. And it caused quite an uproar. And so um, there have been a series of presidential directives aimed at reining in an out of control CIA global assassination program. So as I said, it was first passed by Gerald Ford and reconfirmed and tightened up by every president since. Bill Clinton put Al Qaeda in as an exception in the late 1990s when uh, Osama bin Laden was starting to come onto people's radar screens. But essentially there's still a presidential directive banning assassination. Used to say political assassination. It got changed to just assassination. But uh, it did get expanded under Bill Clinton and a little bit under George Bush uh, with his start of the global war on terror, but mainly uh, there has been a, a ban on uh, assassination as a method of, of action around the world. So that doesn't quite wash. The other place that um, authority is claimed, legal authority is claimed, is under the Authorization for the Use of Military Force, the AUMF. This is what Congress passed. Uh, authorizing the invasion of Afghanistan just shortly after the uh, terrible events of September 11th, 2001. That authority, 12 years later, is still being used by President Obama today for the drone program and for everything else that's going on in the um, war on terror. Passed on September 14th, 2001, the authorization to use military force gave the president authority to use, quote, all necessary and appropriate force against persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11th, 2001. That seems pretty restrictive to a certain group of people, and certainly not 4,000 victims in Somalia, Yemen, and Pakistan. And finally, since the uh, Clinton administration, presidents have claimed an inherent authority to use lethal force to kill an individual enemy of the United States in self-defense. This is an argument that Clinton made in response to Osama bin Laden coming on, this, on the scene. The authority derives a claim under Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution that's the article in the Constitution that simply says the president shall be the commander in chief of the armed forces. So this is their authority. The authorization for the use of military force and Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, command, the president is commander in chief. That's what they claim. Uh, let's take a look at international law even though countless administrations have demonstrated their real indifference to international law. Under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter, a state is allowed to defend itself against an imminent or continuing threat of attack. It is allowed to do that. So the targeted killing of a terrorist who is in the midst of carrying out an attack on our soil or against our citizens might be considered legal under international law. But 
as I noted, the U.S. does have a rather blasé effort or position regarding uh, international law. Let me jump ahead a little bit here. So in the speech, the president went to great lengths to explain targeted killing, targeted killing, carefully selected targets, militant leaders, terrorist leaders, the leadership, targeted, targeted, targeted. You hear the word time and time again. And this is what they've been pretty much saying for the past several years. An imminent and ongoing threat, carefully selected, signed off at the highest levels of the government, and that makes it okay. But when you think about the number of victims of drone strikes, and ask yourself if those numbers could comport with the idea of carefully selected targets, only those who pose an imminent and immediate threat to the security and safety of the United States and its citizens. With 3,000 to 4,000 people, how could that possibly be? That all 4,000 of these people presented an imminent and immediate and ongoing threat to the safety of the United States. Uh, in April, the McClatchy News Service, a document was leaked to them uh, outlining what was called uh, signature strikes. And I'm going to go into those in a minute. But on this imminence thing, they had an interesting quote in the article. They, they quoted um, Morris Davis, who's a professor of law at uh, Howard University. And more significantly, he was the former U Air Force lawyer who served as the chief prosecutor of the Guantanamo Bay terrorism trials. He said, I'm thankful that my doctors don't use, their don't use the administration's definition of imminence when looking at imminent death. A head cold could be enough to pull the plug. These are not imminent threats to our country. And again, uh, this is what Obama spent a lot of time in his speech talking about and just trying to justify uh, the uh, imminent and ongoing nature. So if we accept the idea that 4,000 people could not possibly have been engaged in an act that served as an imminent threat to the United States, then we have to ask the question, well, just who is being killed in these strikes? And the answer to that question, um, sad to say, is that no one knows. And when I say no one knows, I have to include the administration. They do not know who they are killing. They don't know because despite all the talk of imminent threats, high-level leaders, and lists of known terrorists, the fact is that people are being killed because they fit a certain profile. This is what was revealed in the documents leaked to McClatchy. It's called signature strikes. The administration has not publicly admitted this, and the president did not refer to signature strikes in his speech nor has any member of his administration, but the documents McClatchy got prove that this is what they're doing. Um, but those documents and numerous other uh, newspaper reports citing insiders and others with specific knowledge of the program tell us that so-called signature strikes are an integral part of the drone program. Most importantly, the McClatchy News report was based on leaked administration documents that prove that signature strikes are taking place. Signature strikes are carried out against those who observe by drone operators and on the cameras to be engaged in certain signature activities and behaviors. So, for example, any male 14 or 15 years older, or apparently 14 or 15 years older, who is carrying a gun would be considered a militant and a viable target. In Pakistan, Nearly every male carries a gun. In Yemen, the average male owns three guns. So they're all viable targets. Or another signature is if you're walking in a group or you're near a known terrorist camp. All these are signatures that make you a valid legal target 
to die because you pose an imminent and ongoing threat to the safety of the United States. By the same token, large gatherings of men, perhaps armed, perhaps not, meet the signature threshold for killing. It's because the signature strikes that the administration could make the incredible claim last year that no civilians had been killed. They all met the signature. All 4,000 that have died met the signature outline. So, in this manner, the U.S. has come to kill young teenage boys who were out gathering firewood and blew up a large meeting of village elders, killing nearly 50 people in that strike. And these are just some of the ones that have been documented. Most of all, we really don't know who's being killed. So that's the current state of the war on terror. Reckless and relentless killing of thousands of people because they look like terrorists because they look like terrorists. They weren't on any list of high-ranking terrorists. They weren't engaged in activities that presented imminent danger to the people of the United States. They just had the misfortune to be born in the wrong country at the wrong point in history. So it can't be legal. This activity can't be legal. And the morality of it that the president wanted to question doesn't hold much water either. The, uh, but let me get to one last critical factor about this, and it's, this is especially about the question of the morality of this program that even the President brought up in his national security speech. To me, the fact that signature strikes exist and are being used is a clear answer to that question, as I said. That can't be a moral action to kill somebody because they fit a certain very broad profile. But there's a couple more factors about this drone program and this is something that's never talked about in the media. And this comes, this information comes from a really excellent report done by uh, two university-based organizations. One, the International Human Rights and Conflict Resolution Clinic at Stanford Law School and the uh, university and the uh, Global Justice Clinic at the New York University School of Law. They combined forces and they sent teams of lawyers and interviewers to Pakistan to talk to the people who were living under the drone warfare. And they issued a report called Living Under Drones. And it's online. Uh, it's at livingunderdrones.org. I suggest you read it. I really encourage you to read it. Basically what they found out is that in addition to the 4,000 deaths caused by these drones, it has affected the entire population. Just imagine, you can hear these drones when they're flying overhead. And these people are living now in a society where the threat of imminent death is always right over your head and it has affected their entire uh, society. No one knows when or where a drone strike will come. Everyone, men, women, children, everyone there lives in da daily fear of the drones and it's distorted their lives and their society. Huge numbers of parents no longer send their children to school because of the drone program. Funerals and weddings have been curtailed because they would be a large gathering and become a signature strike. So they rarely even take place anymore, these great things that make up a society. Um, as the Living Under Drones program, uh, report tells us, our country's drone policy in Pakistan constitutes a campaign of prolonged and unrelenting terror on the people of Pakistan. Is that what we want? Is that our war on terror is by terrorizing another population? And by calling for an end to the global war on terror, which I applaud the president for doing, but again calling for continued use of these awful weapons, killing anonymous people anonymously from thousands of miles away, I think that answers any question about uh, the morality of this program. 
So just briefly in closing, what do we do about it? Well, as I mentioned, the vocal protest and questioning about the drone program, about the failure to uh, close Guantanamo, and the newest firestorm about the NSA uh, spying, this does result many times in changes from the government. So first of all, we just need to keep that discussion going. We need to keep that protest going. Uh, but there is also an opportunity for some concrete action. The president referred in his May speech, his big national security speech, of talking with Congress about altering the now 12-year-old authorization for use of military force, the legal authority under which this program is carried out. I would propose to you that our goal should be not to alter the AUMF, to rescind it, repeal it. That was 12 years ago. It gives authorization for a global war. It's time to get rid of it. And Barbara Lee has introduced a bill into Congress uh, to do just that, H.R. 198. Barbara Lee's bill may not be the one that goes forward, but this is going to be a conversation in Congress. It's going to be a critical conversation in Congress, and we have to get beyond that, or get behind that, and repeal the authorization for the use of military force. While we're at it, I think we should also repeal the Patriot Act and deal with this NSA spying. Our country's decade-plus war on terror, the long war as the Bushes used to call it, or whatever you want to call it, has wreaked havoc, death, and destruction on far too many innocent people. I believe it's also wreaking havoc and destruction on our own society. We can't just engage in this kind of behavior and keep a legal, humane, democratic society. It's destroying our society, the quality of our own lives, our civil liberties, our nominal democracy, and the worst price to pay. It is a blight on our humanity. It's time to end this war. Thank you very much. We can, even though it's a nominal de democracy, rein in and restrain our government from a global assassination program. I don't care if the genie's out of the bottle. We know it's out of the bottle. That's no excuse for inaction. You're absolutely right about the civil liberties part of it, you know, this so-called uh, response to terrorist threats, that the, the phrase that the government puts out, if you see something, say something. Well, if you see something, say something, unless it's war crimes, as in the case of Bradley Manning, or unless it has to do with massive civil liberties violations, as like with Edward Snowden. But those are the people that we do want saying something. And every time somebody heroic and as brave as Bradley Manning or Edward Snowden steps forward, we need to help uh, amplify their voices because that kind of light and transparency is what we need. The, the fact that there are terrorists who are plotting to do destructive acts against this country and our citizens is real. This is what police work is for. This is what the intelligence services are for. But drones, combat drones, and the program as it's been described by people in this administration, by the president in his uh, recent national security strategy speech, these are weapons of aggression, weapons of aggressive war. And they should be banned, just as the judges at Nuremberg said that aggressive war is the highest war crime of all.